everything with regard to Jalen Hurts since I've experienced him and, you know, since he's come into this league is that he likes to pass the ball. He'd rather throw the ball, and he doesn't want to get out there and run. Mac and Mac guys here on Birds 365. Uh, we've got you for another, oh, shoot, 40 minutes today. And uh, we'll be here tomorrow as well. And then long weekend, Memorial Day weekend, Birds 365 will be off on both Friday and Monday. And then we'll be right back at it next week. Uh, looking forward to the next 20 minutes or so because we've got a great guest on the line. He's uh, one of the best reporters in the National Football League, and yes, I know for a fact he's a Philly guy, so we'll talk both birds and the entire NFL with Mike Garofolo from the NFL Network, who is well-suited to be on this show because he, like the two hosts, are follically challenged, <laughs> and he's got a goatee. The only problem is he's young enough that his is still dark, yes. whereas Johnny <laughs> and I are snow white, but we'll take him just the same. How you been, Garofolo? I got a little patch right here that keeps growing right here, so I'm... I'm- <laughs> I'm getting there. You're getting there, Mike. It's good to have you on. Uh, I think we have to start NFL talk we, right now in this league, Aaron Rodgers, and we'll get to Julio Jones. But I, I do want to take you down the Aaron Rodgers path because it's so interesting. And obviously, um, he was on Sports Center. Everybody saw the clip, and uh, uh, Kenny Main was able to get him. But your perspective and and how Aaron is handling this situation and um, his dis dislike for the organization. Let's be honest. That's where we are with the GM and the president. Yeah, I mean, listen, those are those are two different things to me. One, um, I think he's handling it terribly, um, and I, I hate to do the whole source guessing thing, but I mean, it's it's pretty clear that you know his camp has has let it be known what's what's going on there. Um, so and they've had a hand in it, uh, to the reporting to this point. So that's number one. Um, number two, uh, I do understand his point though. Um, uh, certain quarterbacks, I, here's what I always find funny. Sometimes you'll hear uh, a story about a quarterback having input into personnel and it's portrayed as a negative, right? And then sometimes you hear it and it's portrayed as a positive, right? Like sometimes it's, oh, well, it, it Carson Wentz. Uh, it was portrayed as a negative, that he wanted certain things and he wanted to have input in these kinds of things. And then it's, you know, Russell Wilson, kind of the same thing in Seattle, but whether or not protecting me well enough. Well, they should listen to Russell a little bit more. And then, you know, Aaron Rodgers wants targets and wants things around him because he knows that his his days in the NFL are, are, are dwindling here. And they draft his replacement in the first round, which I know he said, by the way, it had nothing to do with the mm-hmm. drafting of Jordan. That's not true. Yeah. What he meant was, it's not personal to Jordan. Like, I've got nothing against him. I like him. But the actual drafting of Jordan Love, yes, that rankled him because he said we could have used that pick to get us a receiver in a, in a deep draft and, and stuff to help us. So I, I do think he's not handling it extremely well, but I do understand his points and his concerns on this one. And, oh, by the way, it, uh, Packers practice yesterday, voluntary gathering. Um, the top five <laughs> wide receivers – did not show. <laughs> and they're saying it might just be a coincidence that that's the case. They, come on. They're standing by their guy. They're going to eventually <laughs> show, but they're standing by their guy for now. And they all decide to show up, not show up on the same day. That is far from they're, a coincidence. They're standing by their guy because they know where their bread is buttered. And they also know what happens in Aaron Rodgers' mind when he turns you off. When you, when you're, he, does, he doesn't turn you back on. Okay, uh, I, I don't want to get into the guy's personal life too much. Yeah. But you know what, you know, what that situation you know. is. Yeah. yeah. But, it, it, you know, it, as a whole, you bring up Russell Wilson, Mike. I, I do look at this and I say, where are we with quarterbacks in the situation that, like, they want to be involved with personnel? Per, I mean, I don't even think coaches should be that involved with personnel. I don't think there's enough time in the day, to be honest. I mean, so when you start saying, oh, you know, this quarterback deserves it, this quarterback doesn't deserve it, uh, that gets into some murky water. I think if you're you're involving players in personnel decisions, it's probably not going to end up well. You should take their temperature at least, particularly when they're key players. And look, I, it, let's let's relay it to the Eagles, right? The Eagles did try to get 
uh, Wentz's input at times. Now, there was also the coaching staff. There were there's too many chefs in the kitchen the yeah. last couple of years. That was the problem. Uh, but they also will speak to Fletcher Cox on the other side of the ball to see what he thinks about certain defensive players or, you know, how's this working and all that. And, and to me, that's the way it should be. Now, again, the communication hasn't worked the last couple of years in Philly. Uh, but to me, if I'm a general manager, yeah, I want everybody's input. I don't want just the coaches telling me, hey, here's what we think a certain way about how things are going. I also don't want the scout saying, well, don't worry about what the coaches are thinking because this is the way it should be for blah, blah, blah. It, it should be everybody who is a key uh, central figure should have input to you. And that, to me, includes franchise quarterbacks. Now, don't expand that circle too far. Don't go to your nickel cornerback and see what he thinks about your edge rushers because now you're just going to have uh, way too much information overload at that point. But I, I just, I, you know, John, I understand what you're saying. They shouldn't be sitting in personnel meetings, but they should have their input. I, I really do believe you're paying them enough money. Mm. If you can justify, hey, you were paying him thirty million dollars. At least make him do some general managerish work. <laughs> if that's the way you got to do to tell yourself to sleep well at night, that's good. Um, I, in case you don't know, Mike, and I'm sure you do, I am the king of the hypothetical question. I love the <laughs> yeah. re reading between the lines thing. I know all uh, about you, Jody. I've been listening since. <laughs> yeah, yes, what, you do. Uh, exactly right. Um, so uh, I'm going down the hypothetical road with you. If they got under the cone of silence in uh, Green Bay with Murphy and Gutenkunst and Aaron Rodgers. And Aaron said, listen, I can put all of this behind me, but you guys got to do just one thing to show me that you are dedicated to me. You trade Jordan Love. If you trade yeah. Jordan Love, we'll all, we're all good. I'll get all the receivers on the phone. They'll all be here tomorrow. We'll all go forward, sing Kumbaya. It'll be great here in Green Bay. And then he got up and walked out of the office. Would yeah. the Packers actually trade Jordan Love? Uh, I don't think so, number one. And number two, uh, that would kind of prove that Aaron's a bit of a hypocrite, right? Oh, After yeah. Said, uh, said, I, right? That's why I said cone of silence. He doesn't <laughs> want to admit to it. He, he swears them both I, to that same silence. Here's what needs to happen. But we never discussed this again out of this room. Yeah. You guys got to trade Jordan Love. They they wouldn't do it now. Uh, maybe you do it next off season after you give Rogers some kind of contract extension. That you know, and, and here and this has already been mentioned. The, the Packers have a certain way of structuring contracts, which these teams that are married to their contract structure and the, the the Steelers are another one of these teams, right? This is what happened with the Le'Veon Bell situation. Well, they never guarantee anything into the second year of the deal. So everything they offered Le'Veon was a one-year guarantee. Yeah, but it was also a, a, a ton of money that they weren't going to pay him year one and then walk away from it year two. They were trying a similar approach with Rodgers. Whatever, whatever you have to do to make this thing right from a financial point. If you're if you're going to pay that money in year two, just guarantee it. You know nobody's going to come in. Uh, you know your your your, your third wide receiver is not going to come in and say, "Well, you guaranteed money in year two of Aaron Rodgers because he's Aaron Rodgers." Okay, so I, I hate these. Uh, you know we we've got a policy around here. Do whatever you need to do financially to make it clear. So then. Let's say you lock up Rodgers to that deal and you get to next offseason and you plan to keep him for 22 and maybe even 23 uh, and beyond. Uh, you know, then, then, you, then you can move Jordan Love and then it doesn't look like, well, we moved Love so that Rodgers could come back. No, we made a commitment to Rodgers. We've only got four years with Love before he's a free agent anyway. Then you can move, a, a la Jimmy Garoppolo. You get to a certain point where you say, hey, we've got to move him at some point because our starter wound up being here longer than we thought he was going to be here. Uh, so, Mike, bottom line, how do you think this ends? You mentioned Aaron's, uh, uh, let's be honest, his, yeah. his, the, the way he is, we know, when he turns off that, that switch, it's turned off. He seems to have turned it off. A lot of people have gone down the Carson Palmer route. I don't think he can do that because then he'd have to pay back, I think, about $23 million. Yeah, uh, He's got plenty of money, but I can't. nobody wants to cut that check. <laughs> no. Nobody. Nobody. Just, um, just like just like everybody's saying he's going to leave and go host Jeopardy. That's a massive yeah. pay cut. It's a yeah. nice payday, but it's a massive pay cut for him. Go ahead. Sorry, John. It's, exactly. So I don't see a lot of avenues. It's basically Denver, and, and that's it. But Green Bay would have to agree to trade him. Mm -hmm. Mark Murphy, you know, Brian Gutekunst, they, they don't have to trade him. Where do you think this ends? I'm always the one that thinks like, you know, the team holds all the cards and they can just force the guy to come back and he's going to come back. Um, and then it winds up that they just deal him at the last minute. I've, I've, I mean, there's been many situations. I go back to when I covered the Giants and Jeremy Shockey 
after they won the Super Bowl was just adamant that he was, I'm out of here. And I thought, well, eventually he'll settle down and he'll come back. And, and no, he just kept it going to the point where the team said, all right, we're just going to do uh, the deal, the best deal we can, because, you know, he's just he's just not going to get over this. So players, if they're committed to this, can really get a team to just say, you know what, we're just going to we're just going to cut our losses here um, and just move on. Um, that being said, uh, I do believe the new rules in the collective bargaining agreement agreed to last year uh, are going to make it very difficult for any player to make a stance because you're right, John, if he holds out, it's a mandatory fine that cannot be forgiven, that cannot be for, uh, reduced. Um, I think it was smart of teams to put that in the new collective bargaining agreement. I think it was um, uh, um, uh, a mistake by the union to, to let that happen, but they had to concede on certain things and probably said, you know, how do we how do we fight this and say, no, we want our players to have the ability to not honor their contracts. It's a tough argument to make. So I thought it was smart of the owners to use their leverage at the time to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think he winds up back there. I think it's uncomfortable, but I think it was uncomfortable last year and he was the MVP of the league. This is a guy that's used to uncomfortable um, I think he still can perform. I think they still can win games uh, despite it. And then maybe we revisit it next offseason. That's my best guess. But if Aaron Rodgers might be sitting at home watching Birds 365 saying, eh, you watch, buddy. I'm committed to this one. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Speaking of watching, I watched Julio Jones show up on Undisputed the other day. Shannon Sharp fakes out the phone and calls him in the middle of the show. Yo, bro, you going to Dallas? Um, he said, I'm out of here on Atlanta. He is determined to be playing elsewhere. Puts the Falcons in a tough spot that he announces it on national TV. And yeah. now they have to react. Uh, I'm hearing that the Falcons might not even be able to get a number one. I understand Julio's got a uh, major contract. And there would have to be a renegotiation. And uh, it might not be the easiest deal to make. But he's still worth at least a number one pick, isn't he? I know he's no. getting a little old, but he's still going for a thousand yards every single year. Unquestioned. He's still one of the most talented <clears throat> wide receivers in the draft. Falcons trade him. What are they getting back in return? Well, I, I would say this. Um, it, it, let's do it as contract as is. Let, let's say nothing's changing. You're just basically getting the player in his contract. I think it's going to be tough for them to get a first round pick. I really do. Uh, now that being said, um, there is a different value placed on, let's pick a team. Uh, I mean, th these teams don't need it, but, but Kansas City or Tampa Bay. You know what, let's, let's go New England. Let's go New England because they're, they're a team that could use them. New England's first-round pick, if they get Julio Jones, considering everything that they've added this offseason, um, that's a late first-round pick. And if you look at the success of late first-round picks – not that good, right? And and so I think teams, a lot of teams overvalue those picks. I'll give you a team that doesn't. Seattle. Seattle says we haven't drafted in the front half of the first round since I think 2010 was the last time they drafted in the first round, uh, at the top of the first round. So they go, we're just going to use these picks for known commodities, right? And, and granted, Julio Jones is not Jamal Adams, who they got uh, in the early part of his career. Uh, it's it's the late, later parts. So you're only going to have him for a couple more years, and he's been a guy that's been banged up before. I could see a team at some point saying, you know what, we're going to be picking 25 or up somewhere up there. Let's take a shot. Let's do it. And maybe you give them the first and you get something back. That's another way to doing it, to soften that first-round pick. You give them the first and you get back a, a fourth or something like that so that the trade chart tells you that it's really a two. Because that's the other thing, too. If, if Atlanta takes a two – they're going to want it to be a high second round pick. Well, these teams that are in uh, win now mode are going to have potentially late second round picks. So that's sure. the way that you do it. Yeah. We saw it with a couple of trades. Um, I forget exactly how the Carson Wentz trade computed. Um, there's another trade that happened this offseason that I'm blanking on. Oh, Orlando Brown. Um, the Ravens got a, a first round pick back. But because of the way that the, the pick swap happened after that, it wound up calculating to a mid-second round pick. But that mid-second round pick didn't exist. So you had to do it the way that they yeah. did it to make it happen. That's what I could see happening with Julio Jones. All right, Mike, you have heard this term over the years. Let's bring it back to the Eagles. You said something uh, about too many chefs in the kitchen with this organization. Nobody's plugged in better than you to the top mm -hmm. of this organization. So – you look at Jeffrey Lurie, you look at Howie Roseman, you go back to the draft, I think it was a little bit overblown, the kerfuffle with Tom Donahoe, to say the <laughs> least. But 
Nonetheless, I mean, this team's had some issues when it comes to drafting in, yeah. in the past couple of years. Are there too many chefs in the kitchen with this organization? Um, no, I just think the chefs haven't been on the same page the last couple of years. You know, you're always going to have your coaching staff and your scouts. You know, you just you, you got to have them. Uh, and a lot of times what will happen with the good organizations is the scouts come in and COVID has completely screwed this up, yeah. but they'll usually come in um, around mini camp, right? So the draft happens, I'm sorry, rookie camp. The draft happens, rookie camps right after that. So the scouts will be there and the teams will let their scouts see the guys that they've spent all year scouting uh, and, and have them have a firsthand look. And while they're there, they'll have organization wide meetings where the scouts have a better understanding of here's what the coaches want. Here's what our philosophy is around there. So don't just go out there and find a player that you love athletic ability that you fall in love with. You need to understand our philosophy and how it all meshes together. The great organizations that know how to draft well do a really good job of that. And the Eagles try to do that. I'm not saying that they're not trying to do that, uh, but it just hadn't happened with the previous regime. And just, I think Doug Peterson got to a certain point where he won a Super Bowl. And he had a certain uh, thought in his mind about how much power the coaching staff should have. And a lot of s these things, whether it was talent stuff or uh, X's and O stuff or who's starting or whatnot, you know, it became uh, a, a bad communication from the coaching staff to the front office. So the hope is that Nick Sirianni and his staff that they've got in there now. Uh, and, you know, obviously everything's kumbaya right now, but we really haven't gotten to the point where, uh, you know, stuff's going to start to hit the fan. Then we'll find out how good the communication is. Um, you know, they feel like they're on a better page. So, no, I, I think I think it's the proper number of chefs. It's just everybody's got to understand the recipe. If I carried out that metaphor, very good for you there. Yeah, I like it. I got well it. Done. Um, well done. Uh, I want to follow up with Nick Sirianni. Uh, we could yep. do another 15 minutes of the relitigation of did Doug deserve to be fired or not, but uh, been there, done that. Um, well, the owner says he didn't deserve right. To be the fired. owner said it as he's <laughs> right. firing him. Um, from the day he was hired as a bit of a surprise candidate, he wasn't mentioned with any of the other openings around the league, but the Nick, uh, the Eagles decided to grab him to today, running practices as little work as they're actually getting done in these gatherings in the non-mandatory uh, workouts that they're having. Mm -hmm. You read on Nick Sirianni. Is he getting it done, not getting it done? Is going to get it done? Is a little overmatched at this time because still wet behind the ears. From the hiring to today, how do you think Nick Sirianni has worked? There's, there's a positive energy in the building. Um, and let's face it, there was a lot of negative energy. Uh, toward the end of the Doug Peterson ad administration there um, for multiple reasons. You know, when, when your franchise quarterback and your coaching staff are not on the same page and your quarterback in your front office, I mean, that, that'll that lead to a lot of things and a lot of uncomfortable uh, circumstances. So um, I think moving on from the head coach and moving on from the, from the quarterback, who, by the way, I think is going to do well in Indy. I really do. And, and I hope that people don't sit there and say, you know, well, why did we get rid of it? Because, because it was, it was just done here. It was it just was never for multiple reasons. It was just never going to work, even though the Eagles entered the offseason saying we can get him back on the same page with us and we can convince him that things are going to be better going forward. It just he, he never got to that point. Um, so I, 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 I like the energy. I like the feel of the energy here. Let's face it. After that press conference. He had work to do with the with the with the players. Okay, the players saw that press conference and had the same reaction to a lot of folks, uh, a lot of average Joes like like us uh, watching that and saying this is not good. This is a, yeah. he, he just the players were texting amongst themselves saying what did we just get ourselves <laughs> into? But you know they, they've start, they've gotten a better understanding of him. He's been better in press conferences. He's been better in meetings with them, and they understand his 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 persona. Now look, he's going to get into the regular season. He's going to make a mistake because all coaches make mistakes, whether it's a, a bad challenge or a bad decision or whatever. And he's going to find out that nobody's going to dissect it like the Philadelphia market. I mean, I I, I live up in North Jersey now. I'm in the New York market. Um, I, I've been around the league and seen different. There's no pressure cooker like Philly. I'm just I, I thought that when I lived there and worked there. I am completely convinced of that now that I've seen it elsewhere. So there's going to be times where he's going to be portrayed as a buffoon, a guy that just has no idea what he's doing because there's growing pains with him learning how to be a head coach and some younger players on the team. 
Um, that'll be an interesting moment for me because I want to see how he reacts to it uh, and how the players react to it as well and, and the tone from the organization. Um, so we'll see. We'll see because it's going to happen early in the season. Uh, it'll be a pivotal point and, you know, maybe we'll come back and we'll talk about it and, and see how we think everybody reacted to it. Yeah. You're obviously you're you're right, Mike. Everybody's going to make mistakes. Everybody's going to learn on the job as a rookie head coach in this league. We've seen it time and time again. I want to talk to you about the theme of this coaching staff. It was evident that Jeffrey Lurie wanted to get uh, a youthful group in here, an energetic group for whatever reason. If it's Sean McVay, we all know he's sort of the guy, the template in this league right now. Um. I do look at Nick Rollis, youngest position coach in the league, Michael Clay, youngest coordinator in the league. Is he playing with a little bit of fire or, or is this just the future of this, this league and he's ahead of the curve? You know, I thought there was going to be a, you mentioned Sean McVay, Sean McVay had Wade Phillips, yeah. um, Cliff Kingsbury had Vance Joseph. Yeah. I, 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 now granted, I, there's a difference in some of these guys that I'm mentioning, but usually you have a guy on the staff the grizzled veteran uh, head coach now well, turning back to Jim for Doug. Doug was older, but they brought yeah. in Jim for a reason. They, there you go. Exactly. Uh, a guy who's been a head coach before yeah. can kind of, you know, they, 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 they didn't make that move here. I was, I kept waiting for who's the guy that's going to come in and, and, and be that guy. Um, so I, I, is he playing with fire? No, I think he's getting his guys. Um, I, I, I just, that, that to me is, that's the whole, who, who's the guy that's going to kind of handhold a little bit uh and 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 walk him through some things so um that was that was the one area where i thought okay if 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 i could say that they made a mistake somewhere you know we'll, so we'll sit um that that's the one thing for me um the other thing is um what's he 40 i think he's 40 on the dot it's going to be 40 next month June. yeah I, and i said well where does this rank as far as you know even in franchise history, young, there were there are multiple guys who were younger than him in, in, in franchise. It's like crazy how 40 is yeah, not yeah. 40 is not young anymore, right? Yeah. Um, here's the other thing, though. Uh, I think a lot of people saw this higher, considering all the um, experienced guys that were on the market that could have been had, and also the Eric B. Enemies, right? A guy who would have come in and uh, you know was a popular uh, amongst you know fans and even some players. Um, who would probably not have been a yes man. I know a lot of people are thinking that Nick Sirianni is a yes man, and that's why they hired him. Um, I'm, I'm going to look for him to prove that wrong because they're telling me, and everybody I talk to says, no, that's not the case. He was not hired because he's a yes man. And by the way, he's not a yes man. He's got his own opinions. He's got his own things. Uh, that is another thing that is going to be in a lot of people's minds as we go forward here, that he's going to have to disprove, and he's going to have to prove that um, he's his own guy, he's making his own calls, and he's not being told uh, what to do. And again, I'm not saying that he is. I'm just saying that that perception is out there and that's something that he's going to be fighting against. Let me ask about the quarterback, Jalen Hurts. We dissect them every single day here on Birds 365 in different ways. I want to go different with you. Mm -hmm. Last year, Jalen Hurts was pretty damn effective when he pulled the ball down and just took off with it. That was under Doug Peterson, under that regime, under that scheme. New scheme, new regime, new coaching staff. The skill's still there, the ability to just take off and run. I believe, I don't know this for a fact, but I believe after only Lamar Jackson and Murray, he was the most effective yards per carry guy on the yards that he took off and made when he pulled mm -hmm. them all down. Will that be frowned upon by the new Eagle coaching staff? Will that be accentuated by the new Eagle coaching staff? How do you think, we all want to talk about Jalen Hurts, the passer, how do you think Jalen Hurts, the runner, plays in this new Eagle system? Well, they've had an offseason now or having an offseason right now where they can design stuff for that. Um, and they've got going into the season, you hope, unless you lose guys in training camp, uh, a fully healthy offensive line and, and, and a healthy roster around him. Those are the things that he didn't have. He didn't have, you know, everything last year was geared toward we've got to get Carson Wentz right. So that's how they spent their offseason. That's how they spent training camp. And everything that they threw at Jalen Hurts was to be that, um, you know, uh, Weapon X type guy that was coming into the game and, uh, you know, have a couple of snaps here and there. To try to do that stuff middle of the season is very difficult to do at times uh, not saying that Carson Wentz couldn't get out and do some things with his legs, legs as well, but not like we saw him do early in his career. Um, so, so now I think this the mobility stuff is going to be by design. 
Um, I don't know that it's going to be frowned upon. Look, if there's nothing there, you take it and you, you take what you can get. I would say after that, make sure you're, you're healthy and you're not getting hit because we've seen young quarterbacks who can move, take some shots. So that might be frowned upon when there's some physicality uh, on the back end of those runs. Uh, but I, everything with regard to Jalen Hurts, since I've experienced him and you know since he's come into this league, is that he likes to pass the ball. He'd rather throw the ball, and he what, doesn't want to get out there and run uh, and, and have to be that kind of guy uh, a lot of the time. So um, you know, I, I, think it, I think you'll see him – uh, really try to prove that he can throw the ball in this league and not just get out there and, and, and run. Um, and again, you know, with, with, with this offseason and, and a coaching staff who um, in Shane Steichen has run stuff uh, that can take advantage of play actions and boots and stuff like that. I, I, I truly believe you're going to see some stuff to take advantage of what Hurts can do by design. Mike, nationally, nobody expects anything of this team. Nobody. I mean, yeah. Peter King came out this week, bottom five. You guys, NFL.com, your colleagues, bottom five. Mm -hmm. Pro Football Focus, bottom five. Everybody thinks this team isn't very good. Mm -hmm. You brought up the offensive line. I, I think they're going to be better than people expect because of that offensive line. So do they. <laughs> yeah. A lot of big ifs. You can't count on guys being healthy, but I'm playing yeah. the odds here. You're not going to yeah. have historic attrition back-to-back -back years. That's my philosophy. And that way, will it help Jalen Hurts and Nick Sirianni? Because I think everybody, and you know better than me, put your national hat on, they look at the coach, they look at the quarterback, mm -hmm. and they say, this team stinks. But I look at the lines and say, eh, it's not as bad as you think it is. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a lot of times what people miss when they uh, assess teams in the offseason going into a season. Because let's face it, offensive lines aren't sexy. You look at skill positions, you look at um, – you know, pass rushers and and stuff like that, which they do have, by the way. Uh, that's not to say that they don't have, but but they don't look at. You know, they, they forget what Fletcher Cox can mean uh, to the middle of a defensive line and the things that he can uh, do to create havoc for uh, opposing offensive line. So yeah, I mean, listen, it, it give us the crystal ball and, and look into the future, and you're telling us the offensive line is going to stay healthy for the entire year. Yeah, that's worth a couple of wins. Um, so you know, that's the way that they're looking at it. Look, the secondary's got question marks back there. Um, but they look at it and say, okay, we're going to continue to build back there. We'll find some guys. Um, and what we do up front can really help out what we're doing back there. So they certainly believe that they are going to surprise a lot of folks this year with what they're able to do. Are they a playoff team? Probably not in my mind, but, um, you know, are they eight and nine, which nine and eight, eight and nine, it's, it's going to take some getting used to. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. love, you know, we, the, the fact that we don't have eight and eight as a benchmark anymore is just a huge hole for all of us who are <laughs> yeah. assessing these teams going into the future. Um, I think there's somewhere around there if everybody stays healthy um, and they win some games. Now, look, <laughs> I, I think that's potentially a landmine, right? Because yeah. what if they're yeah. just okay? And what if Jalen Hurts – is decent and you go into the draft next year with three first round picks and now you've got to decide is he going to continue to ascend or has he basically already shown us what he is because now is it going to be our opportunity and i'm uh, bearish on the dolphins this year i think that first round pick could be a high first round pick so that's going to be a really interesting one to me if they're kind of middle of the road and he's good not great what do they decide? How do they go about this? Because next year, with the way that they've set up that draft, it's yeah. if Hurts is good, we've got the ammo to build around him. If he's not, we've got the ammo to get ourselves a quarterback. All right. Uh, and, oh, by the way, John and I, when they came out with the schedule, went down, win-loss, win-loss. Both of us at 8-9. So eight and nine. <laughs> we're, 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 all, we're all in the same exact boat together. All right, I want to follow up on his line of thinking, uh, looking a little different. Um. The fact that the Eagles are potentially an 8 19, we we're all saying that, that that's the mix. Uh, let's say it plays either better or worse. We're only a couple of years from move, removed from when the Eagles used the underdog mentality to deliver a parade. Now, uh, readily admit, completely different type of underdog. Uh, underdog is a home playoff team against Atlanta, against Minnesota, and then an underdog against those Patriot guys in a big game at the end of the year. Completely different from, well, Peter King's got us ranked 28. The NFL Network's got us ranked 28. 
it's a different type of underdog, but can the Eagles use the underdog mindset this year to get to that eight and nine, which could be nine and eight. And before you know it, you're in the playoff hunt in the NFC East. Can they do that with a new coaching staff? But some of the key guys like Elaine Johnson putting on that dog mask, can they make underdog work for him again? Yeah, I mean, listen, that, that'll be the approach. That'll be the, you know, hey, they forgot Lane, Brandon, uh, you know, Fletcher, uh, Brandon, multiple Brandons, Jalen, Jalen, Jalen. How many Jalens are we at now? Well, they lost one this offseason. Oh, you know, yeah, one, one, one Jalen lost. Um, yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll be – they forgot how – about us. They forgot how good we are. And we've just been banged up, right? So that, that's how those players will use it. And then Sirianni will come in with his, you know, uh, underdog energy, right, that, that you're already seeing in these press conferences. And that'll be the approach. Will it be effective? We'll see. I think it only can get you so far. You're, you're either good uh, or you're not, um, you know. But, but, but this, is, this is a energetic, hungry, young coaching staff. Um, and I think that that energy combined with some talent is going to win some football games. I really do. My last one, Mike, owed to Jody Mac. Uh, so this is for you, Jody. Uh, <laughs> to Sean Watson. Oh, I thought you were going Greg Ward. No. Allegations evaporate. Evaporate. So we're doing speculatory, Jody yeah. Mack. Yeah. How quick is Howie Roseman on the phone? Uh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> faster than the, the evaporation uh occurs there's still there's still liquid right like there's just <laughs> i know on that one um yeah th quickly quickly he's definitely in on he's definitely in on it there's no question about it um and uh you know i some people who are pro jalen hurts um you know might might feel a certain way and uh, if they're able to pull off the trade, I don't think Howie cares. I <laughs> just, you know. Nor should he, by the forget, way. Forget forget hurt feelings. Yeah. No pun intended. Uh, hurts feelings. Uh, it, it's, it's uh, you know, you, he tries to make the move. He tries yeah. with everything he's got. And everything he's got includes those three first-round picks next year. Yeah. They were committed to Carson Wentz who would never take a $33 million dead, dead cap hit until they did. And they'll be committed to Jalen Hurts. Until they're not. If the John Watson actually becomes available, you are dead on right, Mr. Garofalo. <laughs> Mikey, great stuff. Appreciate you coming on with us today. Uh, if you don't mind, we'll tap into you from time to time to jump on Birds 365 in the future with us. You got it, boys. Thanks for having me. Thanks, he Mike. is Mr. NFL Network, Mike Garofalo, who, yes, is a Philly guy. He might be living in North Jersey these days, but don't kid yourself. He's a Philly guy through and through. Uh, e. John McMullen, I'm Jody McDonald. We're both Philly guys. We'll come back to put a bow on the show here on Birds 365. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify.